Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> uh, this morning, Hebrews chapter 11, you know, in just about every area of life, uh, or of interest, I should say, there is a hall of fame of faith, or a hall of fame, I should say. There is football, there is baseball, there's even gospel music hall of fame. Uh, there's country music hall of fame, and the more infamous uh, rock and roll hall of fame. Whoa, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and also there's less known Hall of Fame of Faith. When I was looking this up, or Hall of Fame of Faith, Hall of Fame, when I was looking this up, I came across a couple, National Toy Hall of Fame. And it's not about the inventors, it's about like little figurines that made a Hall of Fame. I'm like, yeah, Buzz Lightyear to infinity. And, yeah, he's in there. And uh, a bunch of other ones. You know, I was thinking about uh, Toy Story. That has nothing to do with my message, but it's just the way my mind works. And Toy Story, the very first one when it came out, was in 1995. Did I get that right, Ryan? Okay, so I always check Disney with him or Pixar. And, uh, and, and you know, that was 24 years ago. And you know what? When I went to that, I said, uh, I told Larry Moore, I said, Larry, let's go see Buzz Lightyear in the theater. And he came with me. And so after the theater, he goes, you know what, Kurt? That was the first movie theater I've ever been to in my life. Because as, as a Christian, I, I was told you couldn't go to movie theaters, and here you took me. <laughs> and I'm like, I said, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't know how to respond to that, if I'm carnal or what, but I thought it was a good movie, you know? So anyway, there's also a Robot Hall of Fame. And such people as R2-D2 and C-3PO are in that. And uh, speaking of that, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, we did a skit way back in the day. Uh, it was based on the movie Star Wars. And I say skit, we did drama. And we did a drama presentation uh, for the youth department. And it was based on the movie Star Wars. And uh, Larry Moore had built a, and I always get them confused, Larry, R2-D2. So he built the round guy. Looks like a bullet with eyes. Okay, <laughs> built that. And guess what? It is still here with us today. And James is pointing to where it's at. It's up in the ceiling, if you guys don't know that. I'm not lying. It is up in the ceiling up there. It is still there. It's about this tall, this big around. And Larry says, you're not allowed to take that thing down until I go home to be with the Lord, and then you can take it down. Okay? <laughs> And it's still up there. You know what's funny is when we were putting the AC units up here and getting things fixed, I'd have, I'd have AC guys come down and go, hey, uh, I don't know if you know this, but, but there's this robot up there, you know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got it. We know. So anyway, Robot Hall of Fame. There's also the Quil uh, Quilters Hall of Fame. So that's for Mrs. Meek. Where are you? That's, that's for you. She loves quilting. Everyone just got silent. <laughs> it's like, Quilting Hall of Fame, you know? Anyway, Hebrews chapter, I say all that to say this. Hebrews chapter 11 is really God's hall of fame. It's the hall of fame of faith. It's the hall of fame of both men and women that showed so great faith that they're forever written in God's word. And that's where we're at. And that's where we've been going through. And that's what we've been studying. Uh, this series is meant to be an encouragement for us to stand fast in our faith. Hence the, the title of the series. series excuse me. <laughs> You know, and I started thinking about this, and it got me thinking about steadfast in our faith. And I started thinking about that idea of faith and what it means and why it is God desires us to show faith or to have faith. And I started thinking about why is faith so important to God? And why is faith, it's, it seems like the mode of operandi for God, and when I started thinking about that, I, I, I was brought to a passage of Scripture in which our disciples asked this thing. They said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know what they're asking? They're asking, hey, look, look, the hall of fame of faith, who's going to be there? What are the faces there? What are the individuals there? And, you know, how our Lord answered, I think, is the key, really, to Hebrews chapter 11. And, it, and it's the key to the issue of faith and why faith is so important to God and why it is truly the mode of operandi for God. And that is what our Lord did in response to that question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you know what our Lord did in response, the answer to that was, is he had a crowd of children there. 
and he brought forth a little boy. <laughs> and he brought over a little boy and set him in his midst, the Bible says. And he says, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is great in the kingdom of heaven. You know what? Out of all the examples he could have used, out of all the things our Lord could have said, and you think of all the mighty men of faith, and you think of all the David's mighty men, and you think of what, what man thinks of as might and strength and, and, and everything else, he brings the exact opposite of that. A frail, small little boy. A little child. And he says, listen, you got to be converted. Yes, you have to be a child of God. But after that, I want you to know you need to humble yourself as this little child. Humble ourselves. The idea is that God's desire for us is that we humble ourselves to God as a little child does to their father. You know, I, I believe that this really is the key. You know what? When I was little... Uh, we were told all kinds of things from our parents, and we just, we just believed them because they were, they were our parents. You know, they told us, listen, if you swallow gum, it'll stay in your stomach for seven years. <laughs> I always thought to myself, listen, obviously my parents haven't tried Hubba Bubba. Because <laughs> that stuff, I dare you to chew some of that and not swallow it. I mean, you're slivy. <laughs> and it's going in, you know. <laughs> Sitting too close to the TV will cause eye damage. How many remember that one, right? <laughs> then we got an iPhone. Okay. And you look around and everyone's... <laughs> now I venture to say you're a little closer, okay, than I've ever been to my TV set, all right? You know, these kind of things. You know why we believe them? Because our parents set them. And uh, though they may not always have been true, you know what the things that our father says are true. And when it comes to this issue of faith and we're to respond to what God has said by faith and humble ourselves unto the word of God and uh, respond ac accordingly. So then it is throughout the hall of fame of faith that these responded in believing what the Father has spoken. So this morning I'd like to just take a few minutes and I won't be long. Take a few minutes this morning to encourage you throughout this chapter here and we'll pull out some individuals and throughout the preaching this morning, I want you to keep in mind this introduction. Why is, what type of faith it is? What is it about faith that God loves? And God brought forth a little child and said, you humble yourself and be as this little child. What is that? You believe what I've told you. You believe what I've spoken. And this morning, I'd say in the details of our life, as we go throughout this world, may we believe what God has spoken. And you know what? That flies contrary to the world today, doesn't it? They always tell you, well, you know, this intellectualism is, you know, you can, you can overthink something to where you will even question God. And there reaches a point where you to be as that little child and just believe it because my father spoke it. And so I want you to keep in mind of that as we go through here because it's the thread that lines every one of these men and women in Hebrews chapter 11. They heard God, believed God, and responded to God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for a time where we can carve out for you. And we thank you, Father, for the word of God. Thank you for the words that you have spoken. Father, help us this morning as you speak to us through your word that we would respond accordingly. We respond by faith in what you have spoken. And Lord, in, in, in may that work out into the details of our lives, that it would be honoring to thee. And that, Lord, we might find ourselves in that hall of fame of faith and glory one day, having responded to you and your word and belief. And we just thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. First, notice uh, in your booklet there, notice in your outline there, uh, your faith testifies to your family. Your faith testifies to your family. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse number 7 here. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. Now that's key again. He's, he's warned of God. 
He hasn't seen anything. He's warned of God. The father has spoken something. The child has not seen come to a reality. But it says, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house by the faith which he condemned the world and became heirs of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah had a faith that testified to his family. It says to the saving of his soul. Noah believed God. Noah being warned of God acted on that belief and he built an ark. He believed it so much he was willing to go out and build an ark. And let me tell you, he had a lot of commands and that building of an ark is no small feat. <laughs> no small feat at all. In Grand County, Kentucky, here it is right here, Ken Han opened the ark encounter. A creationist theme park with a life-size replica of Noah's Ark. It is, you ready? 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet high, making it the largest timber frame building in the world. <laughs> so when you think about Noah being told to build an ark, that right there, folks, is a testimony to the world. <laughs> And I'm telling you, it's a testimony to his family. Apart from building the ark, as, as mammoth as that project is, I mean, imagine God saying, I want you to build an ark, and then he starts giving the dimensions to Noah, and Noah's looking at God going, what? Uh, you going to give me some time for this thing? Because... And he did give him some time, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But apart from all that, he also gave him the command to bring in all the animals two by two. The, the clean animals by seven. He had to gather all their food. He had to do all of that by faith. All the while, he was the ripe age of 500, plus somewhere around 500, for the floods came when Noah was 600. <laughs> so he's a young buck out there building that thing, okay? <laughs> you know what? As great as that ark is, and as much as a testimony that is, you know, the greatest thing is not the size of that ark and that the, the, the fact that the animals came in uh, by two at his command and the clean animals by seven and the fact that I hadn't even mentioned that it hasn't even rained on the face of the earth before prior to the flood and, and all of these things that are miraculous, you know, the greatest thing is that out of all the people that came into the ark and all the people that should have come in the ark and all the people that could have come into the ark, you know who came into the ark was his family. Was his family. You know what? Your faith and my faith and Noah's faith testifies to our family, testifies to our beloved ones that we believe what the Father has spoken. Being moved with fear, he prepared an ark. And that ark, for the whole time he was preparing it, for the sake of theology, let's just say 100 years plus, he's out there and he's building that ark and day after day from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, that is testimony that he believed what God spoke. And he's just doing it. Every swing of the hammer, every day. Oh, I think I hear no. Uh, he's out there again building that ship. <laughs> Every time he swung a hammer, it testified the echoing through the woods and echoing down the villages echoed that he believed what God told him. Every, every cutting of the saw, every splat of the sap or whatever he used, it testified to his family. It testified to the unsaved world that that man believes what God has spoken him. And I'm telling you, it's a testimony every time. So what about us? Every time we respond in faith and do what God has spoken to us, don't you know it's a testimony to your family? You know what? Every time you sit at a public restaurant and bow in prayer, it is a testimony that you believe and I believe what God has spoken and everyone around you can, can, can nudge and <laughs> chuckle all they want. I want them to know I believe my father. And I want to thank my father for what he has provided. And I want my daughter, my kids to know that God provided this. And that we have a good God. It testifies. Every time we read our Bibles, every time you get up in the morning... And you go get that cup of coffee from your Keurig and you hear that sound. Oh, if you don't have one. <laughs> anyway. And, and you hear that sound. 
and just electricity runs through your whole body and you just go, yes. <laughs> and, and you grab that. But then you go over onto the couch and my dog has just come in from outside and curls up next to me. And I got my, my, my coffee. I got my dog. None of the kids are up. It's the only time we have peace in life. <laughs> and, and I got my Bible and I lay it open. I'm telling you, that's a testimony. It's a testimony. It's a testimony. You know what? Every time on Sunday mornings when we surely could be doing other things. I get it. On a Sunday morning when surely you could go fishing. On a Sunday morning when you could go spend time with your family. On a Sunday morning and it, when you have so much to do, and I understand that. Kurt, it's the, listen, I've got a honey-do list taller than I am. I could stay home and knock this off on a Sunday morning. I get it. I understand all the struggles, and those are real life struggles that battle our mind. But I'm telling you, when you get your family or you get yourself and you get in that car, and as it is this morning, you defrost the windows and you back out of your car and you drive down your street, I'm telling you, it's a testimony to all of those around that you believe your God. And you, and you believe that, that it honors God. And you believe the word of God, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And you believe that. And it's a testimony every time you drive down the street. It truly is. But it's more than that. You know, as we follow the scriptures, as we're slow to anger, as the Bible says, and, 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 and during hard times that enter a household and bad news that comes to us, and, and we go to prayer instead of going to, to fear and anxieties, it testifies to our family how we handle struggles and how we handle the things coming on. It testifies that we're a, a Christian. As we love our wives as Christ loved the church and died for it. It testifies how we treat our kids and it testifies that we're Christians. You know what? Reaching a family members for Christ, those that don't believe, the un unbelieving around us, you know, it takes time. It's not like soul winning. It's not like outdoor knocking. It's not like anything else. It just takes time. And oftentimes they're just watching that, Christ, that testimony of you at work or at the workplace. They're watching. They're watching. And it's a testimony. You know what, Noah, over 100 years here, Bill, it took time to reach his family. But I would say this, be steadfast in that. Be steadfast in your testimony for God. And Noah had a testimony for God. Secondly, on your notes there, your family, or excuse me, secondly... Your faith trusts God without all the details. Look at uh, verse number 8 of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, now notice here, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You know what he did? He obeyed. He heard from God. He obeyed. And he went out not knowing whithersoever he went. You know, this took a step of faith for him. He didn't know all the details. And you know what? Well, we, sometimes in, in life, when following the Lord, we don't get all the details and for some in here, that can be very, very, very difficult. And, and, and God just doesn't give us all the details. He calls us to do something, and we don't get all the little steps to get us there. And sometimes that can leave us with anxiety and, and, and angst along these lines. But I'm telling you, by faith, be steadfast in this. Trust God if he's called you to something, regardless if you know all the details or not. I don't know if it's just women in general. I know there's, there's men as well, but, you know, that they're good at details. If I go on vacation, my wife is good at details. And she's a detail person. I know, I, you know, what time this and what time this. And when you land here at this time and this is going to be picking us up at this time, we're going to go here at this time. And we got a half a day and two seconds at this time that we're going to go do this. And we're going to go eat here. And we're going to go do this. And I'm looking at her at the whole time like this. <laughs> so she stops and goes, get on plane and go to vacation. <laughs> and I look at her and go, 
Got that? No problems. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I know details are important, but praise the Lord she takes care of those. I just, I'm not that way. Details. But you know, with God, sometimes we just don't get all the details. We, we don't. Sometimes we may not get all the details from God, only the direction to go. Only the directions to go. I guess that's called walking by faith, isn't it? I guess that goes back to that little child who her, uh, uh, heard from God and just believed God and went out not knowing whether so ever he went. It's the key that winds this passage together. I was in North Carolina 10 years ago and, and I uh, um, just bought a home there. It was uh, one of those southern homes that, that uh, could have been my last home. In fact, to be honest with you, when I bought it, um, we'd worked hard for it and... Um, and it was just, uh, you know, a home that I thought, this is it. I, I could call it quits here. This is a good home. It's a nice place. It was sitting on three acres. And it had a creek running through it. And had, uh, it had some nice oak trees growing up in it. And it, and it uh, uh, had a, a front porch on it. And I put out the rocking chairs on it. And it kind of sit up a little high like this when I sat in the porch. It was a cul-de-sac so the kids could play. I had great... <laughs> I know I just I had great neighbors and it just had all of that in fact to be honest with you we were um, just updating a few things in it and it even had a sunroom you know with all glass sliders all the way around it so it overlooked the backyard <laughs> and you you could walk out there and grill you know and so you could see why I would think, oh, this is it, man. I've reached utopia here on earth. This is heaven on earth. You know the song? Heaven isn't on earth. I found it. And, uh, and God is my witness. I just put in brand new uh, hardwoods on the, on the lower level. So now it's even looking better. And God is my witness on a King James Bible. I put in that last piece of hardwood. It wasn't a week later. I get a phone call from Pastor Murphy. <laughs> and I talked to him on the phone, and it, and it basically was, would you come back and be an assistant for me as you were for Pastor Blue? And, and I said, well, I got to pray about this. <laughs> and I hung up the phone. Wendy's in the kitchen. I'm sitting in the kitchen. And Wendy's right there. I still remember it as plain as day. She remembers. And she goes, what's wrong? I'm like, you're not going to believe who this was. And she goes, who was it? And he goes, it's, Pastor Murphy's getting Open Door Baptist Church and he wants me to come back on and be an assistant. She goes, well, what did you say? <laughs> I said, I got to pray about it. Do you see these floors? <laughs> now listen, that was a bigger struggle than you, you would think Kurt would just step out on faith, a great hall of fame of faith. I'm looking at the floors. I've lived here my whole life. I know I'm going to trade in that three and a half acres. And I did. It's so, it so ironic. I traded it in for a condo. My backyard was so small, I turned on the mower and turned it off and it mowed the grass. <laughs> in North Carolina, I had a rider. I'm not lying. You drink a soda pop, cruise around, automatic. I mean... <laughs> That week, Wendy and Emily uh, were scheduled to fly down to Florida with their father-in-law. He had a personal plane, and they were going to fly down there together. And so it was, it, was that last, it was the week following that, actually. Like, it's just weird how things work. <laughs> so Wendy and I started committing this, this to prayer. And... Um, and um, prior to their, them going down, I think it was prior to, I'd already got peace about it. Shake your head, yes or no, Wendy. Somewhere around in there. And Wendy, being the uh, planner, detail, <laughs> honey, we just bought the home. How are you going to get out of this home? You have no equity. I mean, we're going to have to pay money to get out of our utopia here on earth. <laughs> Now all this, the digits are starting to rack up, and now I got to move to North, I mean, move back to Washington. So you know, you're going through all the thought processes, you're going through the financial processes, or at least she was. I was just saying, I think we need to go, <laughs> you know, and God will work out the details. And so, um, what had happened to make a long story shorter? Um, uh, they were flying back from um, 
Disney World and they got in a plane crash. And many of you guys know this. I won't go into all the details, but that, that plane they were in crashed. They all survived. Obviously, my wife's here, my daughter's here, and my father in law still with us in North Carolina. Miraculously, they survived. And you know what? Through that traumatic time in our life. In fact, I'll tell you one thing. I'm in the hospital. Wendy's in traction. And I think that's the word. It's all, everyone's broken. She's broken. My daughter's the only one who actually walked away with just snapped teeth off. And, and uh, my father-in-law was not good. And um, I'm in the hospital. And I, I'm standing there looking at Wendy. And I get a phone call. Hello? Yeah, this is Pastor Murphy. This is, hey, Kurt, this is Jason. Just seeing if, you know, uh, if God's led you in any direction at all. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I'm in the hospital right now. Uh, da, 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 da. And I told him a little synopsis. And he goes, and there was real silence on the phone. I'm like, hello? <laughs> you know? And he's like, and he's like uh, I will just leave you alone. You let me know when you had some time to. And I said, listen, we don't, we've already discussed this. We're coming. We're coming out. We'd be honored to accept the position at Open Door as assistant. And yeah, that's what I say. Amen. <laughs> I get to go back to Washington, my home state. So, so anyway, we accepted that. And if, you know, I didn't have all the details and I didn't know how God was going to make it all happen. But through that plane crash, God has provided a settlement on the plane crash that got us out of that home. Got us to move the finances to move here. The finances to buy that, uh, that condominium over there in Linwood and the finances to get one more car so we could get around over here. Now, I'm so glad when I committed to come here that I didn't know all the details in advance. Okay, God, uh, what, uh, you know, to be able to come up to Washington, my family has to be in a plane crash. What? <laughs> you know. But you know what? Sometimes we just trust God without knowing the details. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes God withholding details from you and from me when he calls us is the mercy of God. Amen. Is the mercy of God. Can you imagine Abraham, or excuse me, or yeah, Abraham being called into a country to go whether he knoweth not. If he had to go through all the things that realize, okay, there's, you know, I, I'm not going to see the promises, but I'll give them to Isaac. And Isaac's not going to see the promises, but he'll give them to Jacob. And Jacob's not going to see the promises, but he's going to give it to the 12 sons. And the 12 sons are going to uh, follow a man by the name of Moses. And they're going to go up and they're going to combat a Red Sea. And they're not going to know how they're going to get across it, but God's going to perform a miracle. And they're going to get over on the other side. And there's going to be some issues in a wilderness there. And when they, they get out of that, they're going to meet some, some giants in the land and, and all of this other stuff. Aren't you glad he didn't know all the details? He just, as that little child, stepped out in faith, Amen. trusting God. And sometimes that's what God calls us to do, to trust God without knowing all the details. Thirdly, <clears throat> your faith believes the impossible. Look down at verses 11 and 12 here. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him, notice, faithful who had promised. Beautiful words. Verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the sea seashore innumerable. <coughs> She was promised a child when Abraham and Sarah were both young bucks. <laughs> Abraham would be 75 and Sarah would be 65. They would not see the promises come to pass. Isaac would not be born until Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. Now, admittedly, if you read the whole account in Genesis, Sarah struggles with, with, with this a little bit. But as, as it's recorded in the word of God, she... Uh, as it says there, um, judged him faithful who had promise. And you know what? Listen, God, your God and my God, is a God who does the miraculous. I want you to know that. Even today when, it's, when, when it's, we're so quick to dismiss a miracle-making God. And I'll let you know that he is a miracle-making God. And there's some today would even try to remove the miracle aspects in the Bible as if that was possible. The crossing of the Red Sea is really the Reed Sea. It was about 18 inches deep and they just walked across it. <laughs> uh -huh. It says it's as if it was a wall on either side of them. That's what it says. I don't know how 18 inches is a wall unless you're climbing on your belly. But uh, nonetheless, global flood is, is, wasn't a global flood. It was just localized. Mm, okay, yeah. You know what? 
We see continually in Scripture that God is a God of promises and he brings those promises to path, pass either naturally or supernaturally. And they're all over in Scripture. Imagine trying to get rid of all the miraculous things that God has done. The feeding of the 5,000. I just scribbled down a bunch on feeding of the 5,000. Listen, when, when they talked about giving of tribute, the disciples said, do we give tribute? Do we give tribute? And he goes, yeah, here's tribute. He says, take, take a fishing rod, throw it in the water, and pull out a fish. And inside its belly is the taxes. Go pay the man. <laughs> Miracle, miracle, crossing of the Red Sea, which we mentioned, feeding uh, over a million people with manna in the wilderness. Tell me if that's not a miracle. Giving water to over a million people out of a rock. The walls of Jericho, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fire. I mean, just the list goes on. Opening the prison doors for Peter and, and, and uh, the virgin birth in and of itself and so many more. And I think about all those miracles that God has done, and, and I believe them because the Father said it. And, uh, and I think about those, and what about us? Has not God done miracles in our life? Amen. And it maybe not so manifestly, and, and maybe not so much, you know, uh, 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 manifest in our eyes in the sense of levitating us or something like this along these lines, but I'm telling you, your salvation and my salvation is nonetheless a miracle. It's a miracle. That he can redeem a sinner such as I. It's a miracle that he give us the Holy Spirit of God to, to guide us while we're here. And, this, and, and there's one God, but he ministers to over a million plus people that are believers. Isn't that not a miracle as well? Isn't that a, a beautiful thing that he would convict us and guide us in just the small details? And he cares for the little tiny Kirk Kennedy on a big globe with so much going on. My father's never so busy that he can't spend time with me. Isn't that not a miracle nonetheless? What about the miracle of a changed life? Someone that receives Jesus Christ and their life is forever changed. What about a family restored isn't that not a miracle? You know, after I got saved, I had a guy next I used to deliver bread for a living. I had a guy next to me. I worked for Gay's Baker, and he worked for Langendorf, old companies back in the day. Now they're all friends, I believe. But anyway, and I told him I got saved because I knew he was a Christian. And he started weeping. I mean, a man. And I'm like, whoa. And he goes, I didn't think you would ever get saved. <laughs> And I say, well, I hadn't planned on it. <laughs> you know? Listen, isn't that not a miracle? Isn't it a miracle that God gives us a purpose in life worth living now? <laughs> I think all of those things are miracles. You know why? Because God is in the miracle business. God is in a... Listen, with God, expect the impossible. Fourthly, your faith sees the bigger picture. Look at verses 13 through 16 here. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but seeing them afar off and were persuaded of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they have come out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Notice the wording there in verse number 16. I really like it especially, or excuse me, verse number 13 there says, they were persuaded, they embraced, and they confessed. Now that is, that isn't without accident there. They heard from God the Father. Yeah, I hear you, God. And I am persuaded that it is true. Why? Because the Father spoke it. And therefore, because they were persuaded of it, they embraced it. What does that mean? They made it their own. It was in them. It is who they are. I'm Christian. And as Christian, I do and don't do certain things. And they confessed it. They made it known. They told others. And that is uh, an example of faith. A faith that doesn't always see the bigger picture. You know what? Sometimes in our life, we're called to have that long look in life. The long look. And it'll actually help you. You know, the example of this is Abraham never got to see the promises promised him. 
But he died in faith. In fact, he died given the promises to Isaac. And Isaac never got to see the promise promised Abraham or Isaac. But he died in faith and he gave it to Jacob. And he told Jacob of it and committed the promise to him. Our father has promised this. Now Jacob could have said, you know how long it's been? You're talking my great grandfather's promise? Come on, man. But he didn't. He believed the father. And he committed that promise to the 12. And the 12 ultimately uh, doesn't get to see it come to flourishion. But, but he gives it to Moses. And, and, and of course, Moses doesn't get to bring him into the promised land. And, and it's only through Joshua that they actually enter the land. Whose ultimate fulfillment is going to be through Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen. These were all uh, persuaded. They embraced and they confessed. And you know what? Sometimes we don't get to see the bigger picture. Remember in the big picture sometimes on what God has promised us without actually having it come to, uh, true in our lives will help lighten the weights of the present. Now I want you to remember that. When you, maybe you have them here this morning, when you have weights that are weighting you down of the present, whatever they are, financial, relationship driven, whatever the weight is, by looking at at the big picture, it will help lighten the weights of the present. You say, Kurt, well, what's the big picture? Hey, let's start with this. How about heaven as our home? You know what? The light afflictions, which are but for a moment, have secured for us a farther eternal weight in glory. Heaven is our home. <laughs> How about this? Remember that the, your rewards are not down here. They're yet to come. You have great and mighty rewards coming for you one day in glory. How about this? Death is not the end. In fact, life is very short. How about this one? We will see our loved ones again in Christ. Again one day. A rejoicing reunion. And don't you know that will help lighten the weight of the present? How about this? The governments of this world one day will be toppled and the king of kings will rule all. That will help you when you listen to Fox, CNN, or whatever you got turned on. It will lighten that weight a little bit. How about this one? Every wrong will be put right. I get asked oftentimes uh, preaching or, I mean, uh, or you know, teaching or whatever, you know, what about this injustice of God? What about this injustice of God? What about this injustice of God? I just say, hey, listen, I know this. God is just and he will put every wrong right. And I know that to be true. And God will do that. We can get bogged down in life and we just need to lift up our eyes and look, remember the bigger picture sometimes. And it helps light our load. All right, and lastly... Your faith holds nothing back. Look at verse number, of course, Abraham comes up again. No wonder why he's an example of faith throughout all the scriptures. But verse number 17 here, down through verse number 19, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that was received the promises offered up his, notice the wording here, his only begotten son, verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, according that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure in a figure. In these verses, we understand why Abraham's definitely called the child of, of faith, the faith father. What a quandary Abraham's in. He's got to offer up the very son that was the son of the heir, the son of the promise that Sarah had in their latter years of life, the one they had waited 25 years for is born, and now God calls him to offer him up. What a quandary. How is it that Abraham could respond in faith in such matters? How could he not waver in his faith and doubt God? Well, I want you to notice, and that's why I started out this message with the illustration of the child. Watch this faith. Verse number... Nineteen, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Accounting. I'm, a, I'm accounting it to God 
that if God is telling me to offer up my son to whom the promise is going to come through, then God's just going to have to raise him from the dead. And God can. You say, Kurt, that's an amazing faith. Ah, now you know why in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith. But is that faith really so amazing? Or is it just simple? Is it just like a child? No wonder why the illustration, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Bring me the kids. Give me that boy. And he set him in the midst. And he says, you need to be like this. What it is it? I just believe the Father. And you know what that faith does? As Abraham near, sometimes our, our faith needs to hold nothing back from God. Nothing back. And as we go through, through life, we have things that we often try to hold back. We can hold back our, our talents uh, from the Lord. We can hold back our time. We can hold back a bunch of things from the Lord. And I want you to understand that Abraham did not hold nothing back. And, and if God wants something of yours, you need to give it to him. You need to give it to him. Because our faith holds nothing back. Whatever you have, I guarantee you the Lord desires to use for his glory. For his glory. <clears throat> because God held nothing back for you and I. For you and I. It says at the, verse, at the end of verse number 19, it says, From whence also he received him in a figure. Now in closing, let me just say that, that he says, listen, the, the fact that, that Isaac, when he's uh, offered up, of course he isn't offered up, and Abraham was willing to offer him up, but what happened? There was a ram caught in the thicket, and he took the place of Isaac. And Isaac gets to go free. And the Word of God says that's forever a picture of what I did for you and me. Of what I did for you and me. God mercifully offered a substitute, a ram caught in a thicket. This was a figure, a type of Christ offered up for you and for me to go free. Notice in the text it even says he offered up his only begotten son just to finish off the type. Because there's going to be coming, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. Forever a picture of the coming Redeemer to take the place of our sins, the Savior. Now, I want to close with one verse, and it's, it is going to be up there. Darn. Pull it. <laughs> Kill it. I want you to look at it in your Bible. Turn to Romans chapter number 8. I shouldn't have said kill it. So sorry. <laughs> Romans chapter... I didn't say that. Mason said it. Uh, Romans chapter number 8. <clears throat> And I want you to, I want, I want us to take a look at this in, in, in closing in, in just Romans chapter 8, verse number 31. And admittedly, I'm not going through the whole thing here, but verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Now, how much is God for you? In other words, is he, is he, yeah, I know he's for me, but he really can't take care of this struggle I'm going through. I mean, how much is he for you? I mean, is he, is he all the way, 100%? In other words, is he not only for you, but he'll play the game instead of you? I mean, he'll go to the nth degree. I mean, he will be all in all. He will be everything that you need. How much is God for you and I? Is he only for me until I slip one day and, and sin? Is, is, that, is that God no longer with me? Is that God no longer for me? I mean, how much is God for you and I? Look at the next verse, verse 32. He that spared not his own son. Now stop right there for a minute. When you think of an illustration of how much someone can be for someone, probably the greatest illustration you can have is that a parent would sacrifice their kid for someone else. I have kids. I would sacrifice myself over my kids any day of the week, and so would you. You want to think about love, and you want to think about how someone is for you? Look at verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. Notice the word there. What is it? Say it together. All. Oh, that's everyone on the face of this earth. That's you, me, I, <laughs> 
delivered us for us all, how shall he not with us all freely give us all things? Isn't that a be beautiful passage of Scripture? Yeah. And I'm telling you that Jesus Christ died for you to show you that he's for you. And that he loves you and gave himself for you. That you, like Isaac, might go free. And he that has the Son is free indeed. Let's bow in a word of prayer. <clears throat>